Hi, everyone. Welcome to the TimingResearch.com Analyze Your Trade, episode number 159 uh, for May 11th, 2021. We are recording this at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, my name is David Cosmeter, and I am the creator of TimingResearch.com. And today I have arranged for Jake Bernstein to join us. So you should be seeing his screen right now. And uh, we're going to be talking to him about uh, what he thinks about the commodities and the stock market and mm -hmm. everything going on right now. And I've also arranged for the option professor to join us again as the moderator. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. Great. Thanks a lot, everybody, for being here. I think we've got quite a show here for you. Uh, we got Jake Bernstein and, uh, you know, uh, he'll get into his background very briefly, but I just wanted to say uh, last year, uh, Jake had uh, two of the best calls I think uh, you could get uh, in that he uh, recognized that the soybean market, particularly bean oil, was going to go uh, on a very big run. And also he recognized copper was going to go on a very big run. <clears throat> and you couldn't do much better than those two, especially copper with Freeport McMoran and SCCO that he uh, suggested people focus on. And uh, both of those were just uh, fantastic calls. So we're very, very interested in hearing what Jake's got to say at this point. Uh, but before we get into that, Jake, a quick introduction on yourself to the people who are not familiar. Thank you very much. appreciate the great introduction. So I've been trading for more than half a century, written 45 books. I'm a real trader. I trade practically every day. I'm not specifically a day trader, but many of my trades turn out to be day trades. I'm a purely technical trader, no interest whatsoever in fundamentals, except to use them to my advantage when I can. And uh, I follow specific rules. I've been doing this for a long time, and I know what I'm talking about. So there you go. There you go. And uh, again, the sector that we're talking about here uh, in the commodity sector is, you know, one of the better sectors of all the markets right now. And, you know, again, coming out of the COVID crisis where supply chains were very tight, hit with the big demand. I mean, it's really been a spectacular sector to have involvement in this year. There's no doubt about that. Uh, we're going to start out with some stocks and then let's get down to those commodities a little later in the broadcast. But uh, the people did have some stocks to look at. So let's go with that first. First one is Wood, W-O-O-D. Obviously, it, uh, try to uh, make a hit here on the... Um, on the lumber situation, and uh, you have that up there, W-O-O-D? Yeah, it's showing right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. And uh, it's off a little bit here. Uh, looks like it had a high point um, in the last couple of days and coming down a little bit to the averages. We're looking at the weekly chart. Do you want to see the daily? Um, either way. Okay, so we'll put the daily chart on here. Yeah. The thing to remember is that wood is basically a proxy for lumber. So you've got cut, C-U-T, which I'll put on the screen right now, and wood. Both of them are proxies for lumber. But the real action has been in the lumber market, which I'm going to show right now. Unfortunately for many people, this market has basically been untradeable because it's limit up or limit down practically every day. And just to give people an idea of what we're talking about, this move that we saw in lumber in futures from where it started. I'm gonna put that on the screen right now. So just hang in there for a sec. From where it started right around here on our buy trigger to where it is now was worth roughly speaking 75, 85,000 bucks, 87,000 bucks per contract in futures. So uh, there you go. That's, that's what the move has been like. Yeah, it's huge. It's huge off the charts. Uh, with regards to at this kind of level, you know, um, to initiate initial positions would be a little bit dicey. Call it suicide. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, knew, I knew you'd have a more succinct way of putting it. <laughs> uh, anyway, so that's the story on lumber. And of course, you know, if you hadn't been in the game, you know, it's a nice picture to look at. And if you haven't been in the game to start up here, you know, would have its own set of uh, risks. Uh, the next one, though, is um, uh, in these industrial metals. And, uh, you know, if you look at a long term graph on this, this has a long runway and this is in the Cleveland Cliffs. Um, yeah, I was looking at the long term graph on it. And boy, uh, you know, if you went back on a 10 or 20 year graph, this thing, you know, has a lot of uh, a lot of upside if it got moving. Yeah, here's Cleveland Cliffs. In fact, let me put the quarterly chart on here. So you can take a look at the long term. Here's the quarterly. Yeah. 
So it, yeah, it's definitely been up there and it's just getting started. So if you believe in the economic recovery, if you believe in the infrastructure re reboot, then you've got to look at Cleveland Cliffs, but it's not the only one in the game. There's a lot of others that are essentially in the same business. I was looking at Vail, V-A-L-E. Uh, I think that was kind of one of them. And then of course, Steel X is also there too, isn't it? Yep, here's, here's Volley right here. Volley, I don't know how to pronounce it. Getting started with the weekly chart. So it's already made quite a move. Mm -hmm. And of course, so has the US Steel, which again is your inf infrastructure play. Not to exclude some important ones such as aluminum uh, Alcoa mm -hmm. or the Chinese producer CENX, Cenex, which has made a nice little move lately. Not as dynamic as this US Steel, but still a good trading stock. If you went on a wider scope on US Steel, you know, another 10 year, 20 year graph, it also has a um, very uh, large price range um, on it. Um, and here's the U.S. Steel chart monthly, mm -hmm. and going back quarterly, way back to 2007, huge. Hard to believe that on an adjusted basis, steel has been as high as 196 bucks a share. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, it, uh, you don't know how far things are going to go because you know if it does cool off in the second half of the year, <clears throat> some of these uh, raw material things you know may run into some speed bumps. Huh? Exactly. You know, the whole idea is here to anticipate. Uh, people might want to look at something called BBB, which is the base metals ETF. It's been making a nice little move here. Let me bring up the weekly chart. So it's not expensive, still fairly cheap. My orientation would be to buy it at the bottom of the moving average channel, which is down here. And that puts it roughly speaking at about 19, about 19 and a half bucks a share. So it's still not expensive. This next one is uh, something that I had uh, some activity in when it was around four bucks and now it's gone pretty good. It's a uh, Nokia and OK. This one and Ericsson seem to be, you know, reasonable plays for uh, Europe. Yeah, these these two little stocks have been favorites of the Robin Hood crowd. Mm -hmm. So uh, when they get together and decide to put their their buying power behind the stock, it can it can really move very similar to AMC or uh, or or. Um, uh GameStop GME. But I think this company actually has earnings and it's a legitimate it's company. It is it is legitimate, no question of it. Yeah. And it's kind of like a sister company to that Eric uh, Erickson over there as well. Well, here's your big winner from last year. Uh 10 bucks uh, all the way up to like 45. Uh, hopefully you'll come up with another one of those this later in the broadcast. But uh uh Freeport McMoran FCX. Yep. Beautiful stock, beautiful trade. I like to look at these from the weekly perspective. Whenever you look at an investment, at least for my work, we're looking at weekly charts. That's where the big moves happen. So here was the bucks a share when we recommended it right over here. And of course it's made a heck of a big move, 400% plus. Yeah, but if you pull it back to a longer term graph, you can see that there's more real estate to be done, particularly when they tell me that mining copper is not so easy. And, um, you know, uh, for them to be able to catch up to the kind of demand that's coming out from EV and electronics and uh, con anything that conducts electricity, plus the infrastructure, plus China. I mean, there is a case to be made that there, uh, you know, that this thing, you know, uh, could continue. I although can it's not yeah. the deal it was last year, obviously. I can certainly justify that on a fundamental basis if I knew fundamentals. I mean, if I look at it and say, hey, there's 200 pounds of copper in every electric vehicle and mm -hmm. figure that out and figure what the sales are going to be, there's a lot of upside potential here for sure. And it's not the only game in town that I recommended. I recommended FCX, the copper ETF, COPX, mm -hmm. um, Rio Tinto, RIO, as you said before, Southern Peru Copper and BHP. These are all good players in the game. And uh, again, Chile uh, is uh, one of the big producers and they had a COVID uh, shutting down of mines and stuff. So the game of catch up on supply and demand in this particular issue might be more difficult than it would be in something else. That's true. The one thing you want to be careful of with Southern Peru copper is the fact that it is in Peru. And uh, in, in, in those parts of the world, we have the tendency for the government to want to take over these mines as soon as they become profitable. 
Oh. which is Southern Peru coffee was not favored for a long time, even though it paid a very good dividend at the time. Uh, it's still something that people were scared of. You also make a good point because Chile is trying to take the money out of the, um, out of the uh, main uh, copper company and distribute it through the economy for the have not people. And that's causing a little bit of a stir. That's right. And who knows when they're going to come up with their own, with, with their own cryptocurrency, right? Right. And then Peru is a, uh, even more volatile. We'll call it copper coin. Copper coin. <laughs> uh, one guy on CNBC said, said uh, after listening to um, Munger and Buffett, he's going to come out with a get off of my lawn coin because they, <laughs> they, they, they act like uh, it's such a barbaric thing. And, you know, that kind of they, they're, they're talking from old school uh, vantage point. Well, one thing's for sure, they certainly didn't mince their words or leave anybody wondering what their opinions were about current cryptocurrency. That's for sure. Exactly. It wasn't uh, it wasn't hard to see. All right. Well, the next guy up here is going to be Alcoa, I guess. Uh, AA, we did mention that as a metal. Uh, it also has had a big run. But, you know, is this a spike up that it had to 45? Is that going to be the uh, Seattle uh, needle uh, that can never get taken out? Or what do you think? I think we have to come back down to the lower part of the channel, which would be right about here before we go much higher. I think it's just a little bit too bullish right now. Sentiment's a little bit too bullish. People are starting to catch on to the trade. And by the time that happens, it's usually too late. Now, this next one has to do with the grains. It's a way to play the grains through the, um, through the ETF market, and that's a DBA something you had mentioned a long time ago as well. And it's been a heck of a thing to have in a portfolio. It's been the agriculture ETF up 23% since I recommended it. Not really risky, still fairly cheap in terms of dollars. And uh, if you believe in the grain situation, which is really unprecedented, this thing is, is going to go higher. Well, we busted $16 on, uh, on beans today. So uh, if you were looking for a top at 14 or 15, you're still looking, you know? Yep. Anyone who was wondering about beans in the teens, well, finally, after all these years, your wish came true. Mm -hmm. um, CLOV. That's a health instrument, health investments company, Clover Health Investments, something I'm not too familiar with. But... Hasn't been around for a long time. Not too much history on this one, but in terms of my work, the chart is still bearish. It ain't, it ain't expensive. I wouldn't be short. No. Any Stock right here, but uh, and I don't, I don't see an opportunity to buy it right here. Yeah, maybe something above ten, uh, where it has a little momentum behind it, would be a better time to check it out. Yeah, most likely. All right. Well, silver they tried to hit a little bit, but uh, you can't keep a good metal down apparently because it closed up on the day, and um, we're at uh, twenty five sixty six on this one, and. Uh, those March lows, and I think you might have been on right after that. You know, we were saying uh, sixteen seventy five on the gold and twenty four twenty five on the silver. Uh, you know, pretty much that could be it for the rest of the year, maybe. Normally, we wouldn't expect gold or silver to be real strong until August. So I think for now, it's still the trader's market. Could be a churning activity until later in the year. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Somebody had asked me to ask you a question about seasonals, uh, because obviously you're very uh, proficient at seasonals and seasonals are easy to understand in things like obviously heating oil or unleaded gas or maybe the grains, but it's hard to understand on the metals. So when you're talking seasonal, can you define what you mean? The tendency in the metals is very specific and usually related to mining activity. So for example, in copper, Prices usually go higher toward the end of the year because miners are usually given the end of the year off for Christmas vacations and so forth. So supply goes down, demand go, demand stays the same. Uh, in terms of hedging, a lot of in terms of gold and silver, a lot of activity is related to hedging. What time of the year do they hedge? When do they report their taxes? How do they do their hedging? So there's some very specific and really uh, undeniable seasonals in gold and silver, especially in the gold market. And uh, we can show seasonaltrader.com if we want to, because we can isolate the seasonals very specifically, but we can do that another time. Sure. But basically, uh, uh, it's not just because they tend to go up during that period of time. There are fundamental things going on during that time that affect the price. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. 
Okay. Because uh, the one guy was thinking maybe it's just because gold goes up during that month most of the time, but it's more than that. I would say after being involved in seasonal trading for about 35 years, right. there, there's a fundamental reason for almost every seasonal move, but many times we don't know what the fundamentals are. A lot of people in the business know what the fundamentals are, but most of the public does not. Right. Yeah, because many people don't know what the uh, what goes on behind the curtain in these metals at all. Exactly. Yeah. Um, next guy up here is the silver and uh, SLV, which again, we kind of hit, but. Uh... And one thing I would want to point out that's super important. The silver and gold mining stocks do not necessarily trade in tandem with the underlying metal. I find that many times the silver and gold mining shares actually lead the metals market as opposed to the other way around. The other thing I was going to say is, is and I found this very interesting, is when we ran up to 2,100, let's say, as our ballpark figure for the gold run, and uh, I noticed that the mining shares, although I was making good money on them, I wasn't making 2012 money, meaning mm -hmm. uh, GDX was not going to 70. It was going to 45. Now, when you get it at 15 and it goes to 45, there's no complaints. But okay. when gold is at its 2012 new high, you're anticipating. Now, I'm wondering if the, they were so smart to know that that gold move was unsustainable and it was going to come back down. And so it didn't join the party because they knew the party was going to end soon. Sure, because after all, these guys are in the business. They right. know what their balance sheet looks like. They know what demand looks like. They know what kind of hedging they're doing. So naturally, being insiders, they're going to reflect their action in the stock itself, which will tell you ahead of time what's going to happen. And that holds true when you're bottoming as well as when you're topping. So you want to look at the gold mining shares as a leading indicator. Yeah, and that was almost an indicator that you shouldn't trust the 2100 price and you should have been fading it. Correct. Yeah. One other thing that I heard that I thought was interesting is this last year when we went up to 20, this is probably one of the reasons why they weren't following the, uh, following the, uh, the game is that uh, last year, uh, because we were in COVID, you didn't have any demand coming out of China and India uh, for, an, you know, for use that way because we were in shutdown. So the only thing fueling it was speculative demand. And they probably figured speculative demand has an end to the story. And it did. But now this year, we've, we, if we get speculative demand again, and you now have China and India in there, that's where you could get a fairly explosive move because then the uh, supply might be too tight for double barrel demand, meaning your, uh, your uh, nation, uh, nation's demand plus your investor demand. What do you think of that? If we're gonna talk fundamentals, let's talk about the COVID crisis in India, right? Okay. A lot of demand, especially at this time of the year, comes from gold demand comes from India for weddings and celebrations and so forth. I don't think there's going to be too many people celebrating anything except staying alive at that part. Of, and unfortunately, in, the, in that part of the world. So I think we have to pretty much write off the demand from India this time of, this time around. But I think your thesis might make more sense in that uh, a delayed demand is not an extinguished demand, meaning no. the idea that you're thinking it's a later in the year deal may very well come into play when they play catch up on these events uh, in quarter three and four. And if they do that, and if they do, and if they do that, then your thesis of the bigger move is happening later in the year makes more sense, right? That is a super good point. Absolutely. You know, I'm just not the fundamental guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, there's always a story behind the fundamental too. It, 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 just, it just happens after the, after the technicals happen. <laughs> and if there isn't a story, we can find one. Yeah, exactly. Because we all have to have cookies and milk before we go to bed, right? Exactly. All right. A-N-N. -N. I mean, A-N. What do they do? Auto yeah. Nation. Sure. Auto yeah, Nation. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Yep, here you Everybody go. Everybody wants a car now, but are they going to want one in six months if they already bought one? Huh? It's a big, beautiful chart. Mm -hmm. Training weekly up and daily up. 400% move at least. I don't see anything wrong with this chart, but let me point something out. I've got my divergence indicator right over here. Mm. You want to see price and indicator moving in the same direction. So what's happening is this. We, we continue to make new highs in price, 
but we're not making new highs in the indicator. It's a, it's a negative. And so this is what I'd be very careful of. If you're fortunate enough to be long from lower levels, make sure you trail your stops because when this one breaks wide open to the downside, it's going to go down very fast. Yeah, most of the markets are very far away from their long-term averages. And that is a ticking time bomb quite a bit, isn't it? It definitely is. One of the things I like to do in a stock like this or futures is to trail a three period moving average of the low. That will get you out quickly, but it'll give you enough room for corrections without stopping you out. So 3MA of the low, this would be a weekly 3MA of the low that would protect you in the event of a big decline. And of course, options aren't a bad thing to investigate as far as hedging when you get this far up as well. Well, sure, you can write some options against this, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I'm sure they're fat too. Um, okay, now we're going to the marijuana stocks. Something that you used to go to jail for 50 years, you can now do legal in. And which so one? there you go. Tilray, which one? Uh, no, uh, they have MJ. They're looking at the uh, oh, you know the yeah. ETF that, that takes them all in in one shot, the one-stop shop. Yeah. But we can look at Tilray. That's not illegal. Disapp disappointing uh, performance at best. Right down to support right now. So if you're going to be a buyer, this is the place to be a buyer. But uh, hey, I don't know nothing about marijuana. Last time I smoked was 1965. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy was from Tijuana, right? <laughs> It was, probably, it was probably oregano. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, and it was oregano, but I thought it wasn't. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so let's look at Tilray because that's got a lot of news. And then there was one that bought out somebody else the other day, and everyone was excited about that. Yes, Tilray had a big reversal today on that stock. Let's do the daily chart and blow it up a little bit. So there's Tilray up to date, opened a whole bunch lower. Closed on the high of the day, usually a good sign of a bottom. So that's Tilray. All right, let's uh, move forward to uh, BDRY. Catching me off guard with this one. BDRY. Oh, dry bulk shipping. BDRY. Oh, hold on, hold on one second. It's not on my screen. I can't get it up here. BDRY is not going up. It's, uh, closed at around 26 bucks, down about five and uh, almost 6% today. Let's try it again. No, it's not showing up. BDRY. Well, anyway, it uh, it's had a good run here and uh, it is. Uh... If it's uh, if it's a energy shipping company, it's probably moving because of the ransomware attack. Oh, yeah. It's, a, and it's it, a dry goods bulk shipping. Yeah. It went from eight bucks up to 28. So, uh, and it's new. It's only been out. Uh, it's a new company, uh, it looks like. I don't have it. It's a uh, fairly new anyway. Well, How long yep. been around? No, I'm, I don't well, I'm seeing prices all the way back to 2019. Okay. So it's a few years old. But yeah, yeah it's up. Wonder why. I'm seeing. Are we sure about up. Yeah, yeah, B D R Y. B D R Y and uh, went down to like three almost, ran up to a little over eight, then back to six, and then from six, it's been pretty much screaming with a few pullbacks along the way, all the way up to twenty eight, and right now it's around twenty six. Yep. Sorry, I don't have it. From the start of the year, it's up like two hundred and fifty percent. Yeah. So something's going on there, but uh, like I say, it's certainly not at the low here, and uh, it is. Uh, I think it's making all-time highs. Well, I think the the shipping companies were were moving any, uh, you know, starting to make some good moves anyway. But then the Suez Canal thing, right, uh, really, really helped set that off too. Uh, the next yeah. one who we hopefully have a actual chart for is uh, Fortinet F. T N T, and that was up today. Yep, here you go. Another what I call a gap trade, where you open gap lower, you come up and you take out the previous day's low, and you tend to close on high of the days. So a nice little reversal here. Looks like it might uh, get back on the bicycle here. 
still in a bull trend. Yeah. As did a lot of these tech stocks. Uh, CL is Colgate Palmolive. Mm hmm. Good old fashioned Colgate. Mm hmm. Nice staple. And a very nice, beautiful uptrend. Finding good support today. Still oh, a stock yeah. Sony, and I believe they pay a pretty decent dividend. Let me bring up the dividend. They're paying no, 1.7%. They're paying 2% dividend, which is really not bad for this kind of stock. No, and it, uh, it's off the uh, highs that it had. Um, so it's still got some uh, room to get up to the highs. Yep. And uh, yeah, it uh, seems like it's climbing a very steady ladder here. RJA. Here we go. So we're talking about elements. Is that the one? Um, this is uh, agricultural. Yeah. Yeah. And it's obviously had a nice little move here with the ags. Correct. That's the weekly chart. And here is the daily. Still looking pretty good. Certainly cheap enough. What else we got? Well, here's what I'd like to do if we could. I'd like to do a little bit of a uh, around the horn type deal. And uh, let's talk a little bit about um, the grain. And because, uh, you know, there's some things going on there that are just, uh, well, really unprecedented, I think. Has corn ever been uh, trading at the same price as wheat? Because I've never seen it, or as I recall, and now they're starting to use wheat as feed for the animals because it's the same price as uh, corn. We can look at a ratio of corn to wheat, but I believe you're right. And um, the bull market in corn has been unprecedented. It's been absolutely unbelievable. I think one thing that people might want to look at is, uh, let me bring up a different chart here. Hang on one second. Most people are not... Hold on one second. Let me try this a different way. Why don't you go ahead and talk? I'll, I'll fumble. Yeah, I'll just, uh, a couple of things also. When we look at the chart on corn or on soybean or bean oil or something like that, where it's a parabolic move, is there a way that you go about trying to measure where you think a upside target might be? And where I think, you know, where it's a parabolic move, I usually will not try to measure because I figure that in parabolic moves, anything can happen. I don't want to try and pick a top. So what I will do rather than that is to put in a trailing stop and let the market take me out. I got you. Let me show and you that, something. Yeah, yeah. Let, me, let me put up this chart. I'm putting up a ratio chart here. I'm going to put in the price of corn. So we're going to look at corn futures. Right over here, corn, continuous contract, like so. And we're going to put in wheat, continuous contract, like so. Hold on a second. Here's wheat. And we're going to subtract the price of corn from the price of wheat and look at the chart. So here's the ratio chart, wheat minus corn, big picture. We're going to go to the quarterly chart takes us all the way back in time. And here's the relationship. So we're looking at wheat versus corn. So you can see the relationship here. The highest ratio we've ever had was right over here where wheat was the, where corn was big discount relative to wheat. Right. right now, we're challenging these highs right over here. Yeah, because I I have no recollection of him being at the same price. But a, a, maybe a dollar difference, not you know, not tremendous, you know what I mean? And that would be somewhere down here. So that's the ratio we're looking at. If I did it right. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at a graph on uh, a long-term graph on, say, uh, uh, soybean, at uh, we're at uh, up twenty-seven cents today at six fourteen. Let me show you the bean chart long-term. Yeah, I, I remember seventeen beans. I don't remember much more than that. Is this the kind of deal where uh, we're in rarefied air here, or is there some special situation going on between supply and demand? Because I know there's a drought in South America and there's a drought in Canada, but after drought comes rain, you know. 
Well, here is the long-term bean chart. And the highest beans have ever been is right over here. And that was uh, approximately, approximately 1783. And this is where we are today. So we have not made new all-time highs, but we're challenging the highs that have been made a couple of times. And on that graph, are you looking at the commercials uh, doing some buying with the green there? Yep, let me show it to you. This is the cool part. This shows commercial buying activity. So what commercials were doing, going all the way back to 2015, they had these spurts of buying activity where they would buy and store beans in anticipation of this right over here. And they did the same behavior in all the great grains. So for example, let me show you the corn. Here's corn. Same situation. They bought a huge amount of corn right before this big move. And you can notice what they're doing. In anticipation of every move, whether it's a small one, like here, but wherever you see a low, you see commercial buying activity has been followed by a big bull market. And this is the biggest amount of beans they bought for the longest amount of time in, a, in quite some time. So this is what happened right over here. Hmm. And um, is any part of this, do you think, a squeeze on the farmer who shorted um, futures and he has a crop that he's not going to be able to deliver and ergo he's having to buy back those contracts at any price he can? That so much depends on where that farmer is located and what they did with their beans. So in different parts of the country, different situation. But the problem has been this. A lot of the farm advisory services have recommended to the farmer to sell their beans even before they've planted them. And that causes some big problems. Now, bean oil, you were keen on in like the 30s, and I see it's in the 60s. So uh, if we looked at bean oil, which some, it seems like you have an affinity for, um, is this getting uh, to, is there a never ending story here? Or? The bean oil is an incredible bull market. We picked that last time, as you said correctly. Right. This has been the move right over here that we were looking for. And the reason we were looking for that move is because of this cyclical behavior. Let me show it to you. This blue line shows the big long-term cycle right over here which bottomed back over here. And then there was a smaller cycle that's part of it, which bottomed right over here on time and was preceded by all of this commercial buying activity. And so right now we are in fact have made new all-time highs in soybean oil, which takes us right back up to here. I mean, that I, is, that is all-time highs, right? It is all-time highs. Which is something to be a little careful of if, you know, I mean, obviously, if you've never been in it before, I mean, this is a heck of a time to dust off the uh, Let's Get Started book, huh? Yeah, I've been trading for a long time. I have never seen a soybean oil market like this that goes limit up. They expand the limits, goes limit up again. It's an incredible market, not very much participation by smaller traders. But the one thing you do want to be careful of is this right here, small trader market sentiment is the highest it's ever been in history. So mm -hmm. this blue measures small trader sentiment. The small trader now is the most bullish they've been. And if you correlate this small trader sentiment with this high and this high and this high right over here, you'll see that the small trader, when they've been extremely bullish like this, they've never been right for a long time. They may, they may be right for just a couple of days or a couple of weeks, but usually that precedes a significant decline. Somebody was uh, saying that they thought the um, before we leave uh, the agricultural sector um, that the hog market might be rolling over to the downside. Do you have any evidence of that? I do not. The hog market has been absolutely incredible. Here's the chart. Let me bring it up. What goes up must come down at some point. Though. And let me just spread it out a little bit so it's easier to see. Monthly chart. Is there then anything that would tell you that it could roll over from up here? Or? Sure, these two things right over here, the projected top, which is right over here. Right. The small trader sentiment, which again is also the second highest in history. The highest it ever was is right over here, but the small trader is very, very bullish right over here. And that's usually a kiss of death. And remember, we're going into barbecue season or we are already in barbecue season. If we don't get significantly higher prices above the all time high, which is right over here, 
during the peak demand season with COVID lifting, there's going to be some big problems. In other words, the market's going to turn around and head lower. Yeah, because there's got to be a heck of a lot of longs in there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And Let's, also, uh, a, little, a little dry up in commercial buying. There's been virtually no commercial buying here. Yeah. No, somebody had mentioned that today, and uh, I thought it was kind of interesting because I figured the prices were high. And, you know, selling at a high price is not terrible if it's going to roll over. Right? Well, the best, the best cure for high prices is high prices. Yeah. Uh, with regards to energy, uh, we got the crude up here. It, they tried to bring it down a little bit to 63 and change today, but they brought it up at the end of the day. Um, sometimes I hear that uh, the COVID is going to kill the demand. And then some, sometimes I hear that uh, uh, the demand is going to uh, kill the supply. I mean, what are you thinking here? My work shows that crude made a long-term low. Now, let me bring up the chart right over here. So this was the projected bottom right over here. We bottomed here. We're past the midpoint of the cycle. We've got a lot of resistance right over here. So I think crude's going to have some trouble getting through these levels here. Yeah, uh, at least on the first run. Now, OIH is an exploration and- Oil, uh, holders, oil holders, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you look at the long-term graph on this, if you could get on this train and it ran, there's a lot of upside to it. But let's see if that train looks like it's any good or not. Yeah, let me bring up that chart. And that would be right over here. OIH, yeah. Got it. And let me just bring it to current. So here's the oil chart. And let's go to the daily, which has just turned bullish on my work. So our buy trigger was right over here. These two bars. Let me put a little line over there. So that was my buy point right over there. This triggered, this triggered. So we're on the way. So this one would be a buy at the bottom of the channel support. Pretty good performance today, all things considered. And if you widen out the lens to show a longer term graph, you get an idea where it came from. Absolutely, here's the monthly chart. So you can see that it's definitely taken a lot of, no puns intended, a lot of gas lately. In the last couple of years, so it's way down there. And again, you know, think about it. Uh, the you know exploration has been cut back. Uh, the uh, private equity has dried up. The fracking has been uh, backed off. The rigs have been closed down a bit. So you would imagine that the, they would be way down because of that. But if that's going to change, then the prices might change, right? That's about the extent of my knowledge of fundamentals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's look at this uh, gold and uh, silver real quick because again, uh, they are they had a little bit of a pop off of that uh, that low that it had. And here's the gold. And let's go to the daily to the weekly chart. Let me get rid of this stuff right over here. So yeah, that's the gold right now. Made a short term low. This is actually the all-time high in gold right over here. Mm -hmm. So we're just a stone's throw away. The one that I want to point out to people is palladium. If you've got what it takes to trade palladium, palladium has been an incredible market. We talked about it last year. Right. Here's a palladium, and you can see what's happening. But people don't understand that these moves in palladium, for example, this one weak move in palladium is about a $30,000 move in futures contracts. So you've got to be really careful because it'll take your head off if you're wrong. They take no prisoners. They were saying South Africa might be opening some of the supplies. So I was looking at the, I, th I saw a bit of a divergence on that high that it made towards 3000. And I was wondering if that divergence along with an increase of opening up the mines could give us an actual sell signal up here. I believe you're right. The question is, do you have the you know what's? To yeah, do well, that's the whole thing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, now let's talk about the dark horse that we talked about earlier because it has had a very good year. Today was off, but uh, platinum, and that was the one we were talking about that was going to have a good year, and it did have a great year so far. Yeah. And um, again, uh, very underinvested, I think, uh, and very quiet. And uh, what are you thinking here? Platinum is the only precious metals that's showing a bullish trend right now. 
intermediate term, short term, and long term. Remember that platinum lost a whole lot of ground to gold. There was a time when platinum was $1,500 premium to gold, then it dropped to a $500 discount. And we've been telling people buy platinum instead of gold, platinum instead of silver, silver instead of gold. So even though gold's been good, silver and platinum have been better. Right. Um, since we're on a uh, tangible, what about Ethereum, E-T-H-E? I mean, that baby looks like uh, money is coming in because of that programmable blockchain that they have. Yeah, here's Ethereum right here. Hold on, let me bring it up. ETH. At least it doesn't cost 50 grand a coin. You know? Let me bring it up a different way because I've got the, uh, let's bring it up like this. So we want ETH purchase the US dollar, which would be right over here. One moment, please. So there's Ethereum for you. Yep. And uh, like I say, it, uh, it has definitely been moving to the upside and it's becoming more and more popular because of its dual uh, usage uh, in the digital space. Um, no. I'll trade anything that moves, but I'm still skeptical about any of these uh, cryptos. Even though my son works for a big crypto company and he knows this stuff and always fills my head with great ideas, I just can't figure it out really well. But it is a beautiful market. And these are all beautiful markets in terms of sticking to the technical indicators very nicely. Yeah, it's uh, as order as disorderly as it sounds. It actually technically is fairly orderly. Correct. Yeah. Um, with regards to the softs, um, you know, this uh, cotton market, you know, uh, it, it doesn't seem to have gone up that much. I mean, because, uh, you know, I, I think historically it has traded above 100 quite a bit, but it's still in the 80s. Is there an opportunity in cotton? Cotton's made its move, as you can see right over here. The move started back here in mm -hmm. summer of last year has made its move, has been a very significant move, found a lot of good support. But right now I think we're due for a correction. So I, I would not chase the cotton here. In fact, I would not chase any of the egg markets here. I think they've made their moves for the time being. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you're right there. Um, now, um, here's one that uh, you were uh, keen on last year, coffee, and it was like at 100. Now it's at 150. So the price is up about 50% from where you spoke about it. Um, but I think there's a lot of real estate above it if it really got moving. Coffee is one of those markets. When it starts to move, if you're not on board, it's going to be hard to get on board because they tend to be very explosive moves. Now, the real beneficiary of this relatively low coffee price has been Starbucks mm -hmm. because they've been able to buy coffee cheaply and continue to raise prices on the retail level, saying the prices are going up. So that's the one that's been significantly impacted by these low prices. But coffee is a beautiful futures market if you've got what it takes to trade it because it can be quite volatile. Yeah, and they do have options, but they're very fat. So you almost have to spread them and then the bid offers are pretty wide. So that makes that cumbersome as well. Right. The one that we should not forget about is this one right here, sugar, mm -hmm. because it has not yet really started its big move. Let me bring it up on the screen. There's anything above anything about that 16 number looked pretty sharp to me. That's right. Here's the sugar. And there's the sugar ETF, C-A-N-E. Mm -hmm. Used to be one SGG. I don't know uh, what uh, SGG. I think SGG is still is still tradable. So there, here's one that's just basing and beginning to move is sugar. And um, with regards to uh, the lumber at 1544. I mean, is there any, because, you know, some of the home builders today got whacked pretty hard. And I'm wondering if uh, people are starting to uh, discount the future and the future may be more lumber coming on the market and maybe housing slowing down a little bit at some point. Well, the best cure for high prices is high prices. So here's what XHB, the home builders ETF did today. Right, right. It came down and did not recover, but closed right at support. Mm -hmm. So the next couple of days should tell the story. but. As far as lumber is concerned, we talked about that earlier. You got, you've got to be nuts to trade lumber futures because they just limit up, limit down. 
they expand the limits practically every day and it's pretty pretty scary let's uh, go into that us dollar uh, d uh, i'm looking at the dxy on the stock exchange and uh it looks like after it broke under its 50 and 200 day moving average at 91.75 or 91.50, it was kind of given up the ship. And uh, it looks like uh, it continued to give up the ship a little bit today. Let me bring up the dollar. One second, please. Yeah. The euro is back above 120. The uh, British pound is at a tremendously uh, good recovery above 141 now. So here's the dollar. The one thing you want to look at in the dollar is this. I like to trade the dollar as UUP or UDN. UUP is the ETF for the dollar going up, and UDN is the ETF for the dollar going down. Okay. Everything I'm looking at here, and I know it's going to be contrary, so I'm going to be a contrarian here. Everything I'm looking at says the dollar is bottoming. If the dollar is bottoming and about to give a buy trigger, what does that mean about interest rates? It means that interest rates are going to have to go up. So Regardless of what Powell says, regardless of what the Fed's doing, I'm saying interest rates go up later in the year, maybe sooner rather than later, and that benefits the dollar significantly. With yeah. regards to, uh, so if the dollar were to firm up, then the euro obviously would have a, probably a limited uh, upside to it from here. Yeah, I think the, I think the foreign currencies relative to the dollar are going to go down. Yeah, they've looking, had good runs, yeah. Yeah, I think the dollar is going to be a big play on the upside. And a really good little way to do it is with this UUP ETF. I got you. Uh, turning towards the bond market, before we get into the stock indexes, uh, what are we thinking on the treasury bond? Because uh, today, I think it uh, got whacked a little bit. Of course, people are probably hedging going into the CPI number. Yep. Well, here's the TBT ETF for the, for the interest rates. Right. And I want you to look at this right over here. Lower prices, higher indicator. It's mm -hmm. a very beautiful divergence that on some of my work has already triggered. So basically we're saying that the TBT has made its low and is gonna move higher. And the TBT is a proxy for people who think that the um, uh, rates will be going higher and TLT is a proxy for people who think they're going lower. Correct. You got it. Here's TLT, the exact opposite chart. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for this thing to be any good on TLT, you got to be above 141. And if you got above 141, that would change the tune. But it isn't above 141, so you don't change the tune. Yeah, you know, another thing you got to remember in terms of fundamentals, for what I know, you can't, can, you can't continue to print money. You can't continue to have 5 or $6 trillion spending without some impact somewhere down the road in terms of raising interest rates. It's just can't, it does not, it's not gonna happen. In other words, you're gonna, you're gonna have to have higher rates at some point in time. And so just be really careful with these because it's gonna be very volatile. It's gonna be interesting to see how that game is played in terms of whether it causes inflation or not. But right now there are very few commodity markets that are going down. So all of that spells significant commodity inflation down the road. Now, another question somebody had that they wanted to ask you was uh, on money supply. You know, we have money supply that went up like 25%, but some people are thinking money supply might be peaking and money velocity has been very, very lagging. So uh, if we peak in money supply, a lot of people think two or three years down the road, you actually get the inflation. But in this instance, you think the inflation could be uh, much sooner? All of that money supply talk is way above my pay grade. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You're, you're strictly at, uh, looking at it from technical, believe me, and then you, whenever you invest in anything, you're investing in the flow of money. So the technicals obviously are more important than, uh, than stories. You know what I mean? You know, the, 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 the fundamentals are always known and advanced by insiders. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if I can get a lead on the indicator of the, in, on the fundamentals using my indicators, that's what I want to do. Don't, I don't like to clog my mind with too much thinking because then I'm definitely going to screw up. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's three basic uh, uh, index, indexes that people look at. So let's try to look at those before we close out. Uh, the first one being the S&P 500. Um, went all the way up to, what was the high? 42, 25 or 50, something like that. And now it's about almost 100 points lower. Is this um, 
a buy the dip or is it a situation where um, we may, you know, have the summer off? I think we buy the dip. We close just a little below support. This is the S&P chart showing the daily chart. The weekly chart, which is what I prefer to use for investments, has not even come down to support yet. So we could still go lower and remain in a very significant bull market. I do not buy this sell in May and go away. It does, just does not work. It's not true. Mm -hmm. So I'm still in a very big bull market. And the evidence is very significant. You had some really important leading stocks today, like Palantir, that closed a bunch higher after opening a bunch lower. So let me show that chart. PLTR. It was getting hit hard. Yeah. It was getting hit hard. And here's what happened. It's a beautiful chart, actually, today. Let me bring it up. Check that out. That's today, right over here. Gap mm -hmm. lower opening, significantly one of the biggest large range, one of the largest range days we've had in a long time. So I think on an intermediate to longer term basis, this is a stock to own uh, for a significant move. And this might be an indicative that people are willing to buy the dip. That's right. And we want to look at the diamonds. So here's the Dow Jones on the diamonds. You wouldn't even know that it was a down move today because we found support right at the bottom of the channel. This is the daily chart and the weekly chart still looking very bullish to me. And then, of course, the one that's been hit the worst is the Qs. So let's look at the Qs. Yeah, which would be the NASDAQ. And that was the next one I was going to ask you about. Yeah. Right. So there's the Qs also closing right at support on the weekly chart and the daily chart. Not very much damage done because even though the chart is lower, there's been no sell trigger on my work. And today's gap lower opening and close toward the high of the day is a very significant technical development if we follow through. The last one would be the Russell uh, 2000 small caps and a lot of the reopening stocks. One second, please. I use IWM if you want to just use that. Oh, yeah, IWM, absolutely. I was going to show IW, yeah, it's easier. IWM. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, got it right over here. I thought there was a lot of support around 220. It went to 214 today, but I think it made a recovery, but I don't know if it came all the way back. Yeah, we will see if today's bargain hunting carries through to tomorrow. Tomorrow is a critically important day. Absolutely. If we, if we can negate the negativity that happened yesterday and follow through to the upside on based on the recovery that occurred today, then we're out of the woods and getting ready back up to challenge the highs. In this kind of a deal here, though, would you say, because, you know, the Tuesday and Thursday are sometimes reversal days. And uh, obviously, Tuesday here, we had a bit of a reversal by going way down and then coming back up. Uh, if we had a decent day tomorrow on IWM, but by Thursday, you can't get above this 225, 226 area. Is it possible we have another reversal on uh, on Thursday and Friday? Maybe retail sales gets people wiggy or? Yeah, that would be problematic if we, if we weren't able to maintain. And here's the thing that I'll, I'm always looking at is this. I look at the indicator, the momentum indicator, and I see momentum indicator keeps going down. Price keeps going up. That's not a positive development. So the market has to prove itself and head back higher again. And it has to do it fairly quickly. Otherwise, we will definitely have some problems here. Sure. Well, we're coming to the top of the hour, Jake. And uh, I, as usual, you gave everybody more than they bargained for. And uh, the main thing is, is I know you have some uh, seminars and other things that you're doing at the company. So why don't you uh, give a little idea to the people how they can get a hold of you and also what uh, events or things they can do to become more acquainted with your work, which obviously people should do. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, just go to my website, jakebernstein.com. There's a cycles webinar coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, send you a copy of my newsletter if you want to see it. It's a video report. comes out every week. And that's really all the promotion I want to do. Sure. All right. Well, it's great to have you here. As far as option professors concerned, we do have a, a weekly um, update on the markets. So if you go to optionprofessor.com, you can get an explanation on that and put in your email and you can get an update as well. Uh, again, always great to have you, Jake. Uh, I definitely would like to talk to you uh, as we get more into the summer and see how these things are resolved because I think it's going to be a very exciting uh, remainder of the year. So there'll be a lot of things going on and uh, maybe in a month or so we could have another meeting and, uh, and update everything we talked about today. 
Would be my pleasure. And thanks for all your good work. Thank you very much, Jake. I'm going back to David now. And thanks, everybody, for showing up. I hope you guys learned something. And uh, I think you're very fortunate to hear the speaker today. Thank you. And you, too. And thanks, David. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks, Jake. Thanks for being here. And uh, so just a quick reminder for everyone. Um, be sure to subscribe to Timing Research on YouTube and your favorite podcast app or network uh, to get access to to this show as soon as I can get the archive posted, as well as any of the past shows. So, and then also if you uh, if you just go to timingresearch.com, you can also get the archives there. So, I'm sure you'll want to uh, review the <laughs> all the information that we discussed today. Lots of good lots of good information today. So. Um, yeah, you can always uh, always get the archive and, and rewatch or re-listen as, as many times as you want. So um, just want to thank my guest again for today, Jake Bernstein of jakebernstein.com and uh, uh, the option professor of option, optionprofessor.com. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Jake. <laughs>